Howdy and welcome to Math 153 Elementary Statistics. This is the lecture for section 1.3 and 1.4. And my name is Lance Curtis. Here in this lecture, we're going to finish up chapter one, the final two sections, talking about types of data and collecting sample size. So as you can see, there are four sections in chapter one. We're going to finish up the chapter in this lection. So let's get started by talking about the different types of data that we can have in our statistical analysis. Now, I mentioned in the last lecture, statistics basically is taking data to make inferences about a population. Okay, that's why we take samples. We don't want to take a census because remember, a census involves taking all the members of the population. Often that's too costly in terms of time and money. So what we want is to take a sample that's characteristic of the population. And one reason why we want to do that is because we can use the characteristics of the sample to tell us about the characteristics of the population. So for example, we can determine the uh, percentage of men and women in a given town by taking a sample of that population okay it's characteristic of it and then using that sample to make inferences about the characteristics of the population sometimes though we also want to make predictions about the population so this would be useful for say statistical analysis to make a prediction about how that same town is going to vote in the next election which political party is going to carry the day. So statistics can be used to serve either end, whether we're going to make inferences about characteristics or predictions. Now, in order to do that effectively, we need to know and understand the different types of data that can be used in our statistical analyses, because different types of data are going to demand different types of analysis. So let's dig into that. First, we need to understand a parameter is simply a measurement or characteristic of a population. Okay, so when you see the word parameter, you need to think population. On the other hand, when you see the word statistic, you need to think sample. Okay, statistics are measurements and characteristics of a sample, whereas a parameter is the same for a population. So parameters go with population, think the same first letter P, and statistics go with samples, think the same first letter S. Once we have that clarified, then we need to understand that there could be quantitative data and qualitative data. The quantitative data, as the name suggests, consists of numbers that represent counts or measurements. In other words, the numbers are communicating a quantity. Okay, now numbers may not necessarily be quantitative data. Numbers could be qualitative data, as we'll see in a moment. But when we're talking about quantitative data, the number is representing a count or measurement. Okay, now this could also be called numerical data, because essentially, Counts and measurements are numbers. Here's some examples of quantitative data. The weights of supermodels, ages of respondents, the number of eggs in a carton, the distance between two cities, the quantity of coins in a jar. These are all counts or measurements, and they represent quantitative data. Now, quantitative data being a count or a measurement, you can probably guess we're going to subclassify this even further between counts and measurements and thus we do but the terms that we use are discrete data and continuous data let's take a look at both of those types of data if you're talking about discrete data then what you're really talking about are whole number values so these are the counts so if the value represents a count something that you would consider to be um, in whole units then you're looking at quantitative data that is discrete data. Now, for the examples that we just saw from the previous slide, which of those do you think are discrete data? 
Well, let's take a look at them. First, we have the weights of supermodels. Well, this is not discrete data because we don't report weights in terms of whole numbers. We report weights in terms of pounds or kilograms, and then we get parts of those measurements. So this would not be a, an example of discrete data. Likewise, the ages of respondents would not be considered discrete data, although it depends on how you're looking at this. If you look at age the way we typically talk about it, which is reporting just the year, then that is a whole number and would count as discrete data. But technically, age is not just the whole number of years. Age is also the months, the weeks, the days, so on and so forth, the parts of a year that you would report with it. And because of that, age is not necessarily a whole number. Technically, it's also including the parts and so it would not be discrete data. The number of eggs in a carton, however, is discrete data, okay? Because you're not gonna count a partial egg. And by the way, if you do see a partial egg in the carton, you need to just put that back on the shelf and get you a new carton because yeah, it's just bad. So we're going to count the number of eggs in a carton. Those are whole numbers and therefore discrete data. The distance between two cities, again, this is a measurement where you're going to use parts of miles or kilometers or whatever unit you're using to measure the distance. You, you're going to measure parts as well as whole units. Therefore, this is not an example of continuous data, rather discrete data. Finally, the color of coins in a jar is an example of discrete data. You're not going to count a partial coin. You're going to count whole entire coins. These are whole numbers. Therefore, discrete data. Continuous data, on the other hand, is when you have values that consider parts as well as the whole unit. Okay, so in other words, the numbers in continuous data are representing a range of values from a continuous scale, hence the name continuous data. So if you look at those same examples, I bet you you would be anticipating that the examples that were not discrete data are going to be continuous data and you would be right to anticipate that so the weights of supermodels that's continuous data because we consider the part as well as the whole same with the age of respondents we're considering the months the weeks so on and so forth parts of the year as well as the years themselves the number of eggs in a carton would not be continuous data because we're not counting parts as well as wholes. There's no range of values, okay? The distance between two cities, say the distance between Seattle and Boise, it's approximately 500 miles, give or take a few. Well, we're going to consider parts of miles as well as the miles themselves. So therefore, the distance between two cities is an example of continuous data. The quantity of coins in a jar, as we mentioned before, we're just counting whole coins, there's no parts of coins being counted, therefore is it an example of continuous data. So quantitative data can be either discrete or continuous. Of course, data may not be quantitative, in which case we call it categorical data. Okay, a common name for categorical data is qualitative data. Some people also call it attribute data because the data itself are attributes. They're identifiers, names, labels. These represent categories. And therefore, it is called categorical data. Some examples of categorical data you see here on the screen. The gender of professional athletes. The alma mater of respondents. The type of milk you might drink and shirt numbers on professional athlete uniforms. Now, notice these last two contain numbers. Just because data is a number doesn't mean it's quantitative. In these cases, these numbers are qualitative. They are categorical data. And the reason why is because these numbers represent unique identifiers. Okay, no two members of the athletic team are going to have the same number. Each number uniquely represents an individual person, a unique member of the team. 
And therefore, the number is not a measurement or a count, but rather an identifier. And that makes it categorical data. Additionally, we can also classify data by what's called levels of measurement. Okay, and there's four types. Nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. Let's dig into each one of these. So first, nominal data has two defining characteristics. Okay, nominal data consists of categories only, so only identifiers. Okay, there's no numbers unless the number itself is some type of identifier. Typically, you won't see numbers, though, as nominal data. Second, nominal data cannot be arranged in any sort of ordering scheme, say from high to low. So an example you see here on the screen, say there's a survey with the possible responses to a question being, you either agree, you disagree, or you're not sure. Well, these are categories, okay? There's no measurements or counts here. And they can't really be arranged in any sort of ordering scheme. I mean, there's an ordering here on the screen, not sure, disagree, agree. But what's to say that ordering them agree, disagree, not sure, is any more right or wrong? Alternatively, I could order it as disagree, agree, not sure. I could say not sure, agree, disagree. I mean, th th there's a host of possible arrangements. And no one of them is any more right or ordered than the other. So therefore, this is an example of what we would call nominal data. Now, ordinal data has two defining characteristics. It can be arranged in some order, but the differences between those data values either cannot be determined or meaningless. A good example is a set of letter grades. So let's say you got a data set that's got letter grades from uh, a sort of sampling of students. Well, we can arrange this in some order, A, B, C, D, F, or we could go the other way, F, D, C, B, A. That order has some meaning to it. But the differences between individual data values cannot be determined. I mean, what is an A and what is a B? I mean, the A could be any 90 something percentage uh, or 100 percent, whereas the B could be any 80 something percentage. Well, you know, I could have, you know, an A could represent, say, 91 percent or it could represent 100 percent. It could represent 95 percent. The B could represent 80 percent or 83 percent. 87%. So let's say let's say the B represents 85% and the A represents 95%. Well, in that case the difference is 10%. But we don't know that the A is 95% nor do we know that the B is 85%. I mean, the difference between the two could be as small as 1% or as great as 20%. We simply don't know where it is. And so because we can't determine it by looking at the letter grade alone, then that means the difference cannot be determined, but we can arrange them in some order. The A is always going to be greater than the B. The B is always going to be less than the A. So therefore, this is an example of ordinal data. Interval data means that you have data can, that can be arranged in some order. The differences between the data values are meaningful, but there's no natural zero point which means there's no place where none of the quantity that's being measured is, is present. An example would be a data set of years. Okay, we can arrange the years in some order from low to high or from high to low. We can uh, look at the differences between individual years and there's, there's meaning between that. Okay, I mean 1970 and 1776 are both 70s but there's a big difference between 1970 and 1776. But there's no natural zero point with any of these values. I mean, we're not really measuring a quantity per se, as we are measuring passage of time from a, from a con conventional uh, starting point. I mean, the zero point in this case would be the birth of Christ, but who's to say we have to use that as our starting point, as our standard? I mean, we can use any standard we want and just measure from that point. So there is no natural zero point here, okay? Because the standard 
can be moved around wherever it is. It, there's, there's no place where none of what you're trying to measure is being present. Therefore, this is an example of what we call interval data. And then finally, ratio data also has three characteristics. It's essentially interval data where there is a natural zero point. So an example would be, you know, measuring speed of an automobile. So you're measuring the speed of different automobiles at a set point, or the same automobile at different set points. There, you know, there's a way to arrange the measurements in some order, because they're numbers. The differences between the data values are meaningful. I mean, there's a big difference between going 20 miles an hour and going 70 miles an hour. And there is a natural zero point. There is a point where you are not moving. So there is zero speed. So here we have an example of ratio data. It's essentially interval data where there is a zero point. So to recap, levels of measurement, four types, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. Nominal means you have categories only. Ordinal means you have categories with some order to them. Interval means you have differences, but no natural zero. And ratio means you have differences between the data points with a natural zero. So that concludes the third section of chapter one. Now let's dig into our final section to finish out chapter one. We're going to talk about collecting sample data. I mentioned in the last lecture that how you get your data makes all the difference in the world for the quality of the statistical analysis that you're going to conduct. It's garbage in, garbage out. You put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. Okay. And there are ways to manipulate the data if, you know, your, your data collections methods aren't really are to snuff, but you know, there comes a point where there's only so much you can do. I mean, some of the trash you throw away, you can recycle, but you can't, there, some of that trash is just, you can't do anything with it, but just get rid of it. There's just, there's just nothing else to do with it. Okay. Statistical data is the same way. Uh, of particular importance is simple ram random sample, which we'll talk about here in a moment. So when we talk about the data that we collect, okay, we need to look at not only how can we collect it, but where we collect it from. There's typically two types of sources for our data collection. The first is an observational study, and the second is an experiment. So let's talk about each of these different types. An observational study is essentially where you're just observing the sample set. You're not trying to modify it or transform it or treat it in any way. So an example of that would be the Pew Research Center surveying 2,252 adults and finding that 59% of them go online wirelessly. Okay. This is an example of an observational study because there's no attempt to change or modify the people in the study. You're just going to them and asking them a question. Do you go online wirelessly or not? And so you're just observing what's there. You're not trying to uh, modify or change any, any of the behavior in the subjects. You're just looking at what is it that they do or don't do and you're just taking your data from that. On the other hand, an experiment is where you are trying to make some modification in your sample size. And usually you have a control group and a treatment group, and then you're looking at the differences between the two groups to observe the effects of a treatment. So a good example of this would be the famous uh, experiment by Dr. Jonas Salk in 1954 as part of his effort to develop a vaccine for polio. It, he conducted what was then and still is the largest public health experiment ever. He took basically a little over 200,000 children and gave them his vaccine for polio. And then he took another group of approximately the same number of children and gave them as placebo. In other words, he just basically injected sugar water into their system. So he was looking at a treatment group and a control group. And because he's trying to modify a portion of his sample, okay, with the treatment, this is what we would call an example of an experiment. 
By the way, uh, statisticians sometimes call the subjects of their experiments experimental units, which sounds kind of creepy when you're talking about people. You know, it's like uh, experimental units. These are people, experimental units. Ooh. I mean, it just seems kind of creepy to use that as a name for people, but no, no, maybe it's just me. <sighs> Anyway, either way you slice it, when you're looking at an observational study or an experiment, you still have to consider how you're sampling your population because that's going to have a great influence over the quality of the data set, which in turn will have an influence over the quality of your conclusions that you make from your statistical study. So it behooves us to understand what the different sampling methods are. And there's several types. You can see them here on the screen. Let's go over each one of them in turn. So first on the list is random sampling. In a random sample, you're basically looking at each individual member of a population and giving it an equal chance of being selected. Now, there's a special type of random sampling called simple random sampling. And in simple random sampling, it's the same idea but applied to sets. So if you look at the illustration there on the slide, on the right side of the slide, this is an example of random sampling, not simple random sampling. It's an example of random sampling because each member of this population has an equal chance of being selected. Notice we're selecting individuals from the population. If, on the other hand, we were taking sets out of the population, so instead of taking 2, 5, 8, 10, we looked at set 1, 2, 3, 4. And if that had an equal chance of being selected as set 5, 6, 7, 8, and set 9, 10, 11, 12, then we would be looking at simple random sampling. But because we're taking individuals out, it's not simple random sampling. It's just plain random sampling. There's also systematic sampling, where you're taking every kth element from your population. So here in the example on the slide, k equals 3, because we're taking every third unit for a sample. So we just start with, say, just randomly select your starting point. Say we're going to start with the second one. So then the next one, because k is 3, we're going to take third unit from that. So that's number 5, and then number 8, and then number 11. And if we had more in the population, we'd, we'd go on every third unit from that. That systematic sampling. Convenient sampling means you're taking a sample from whatever is easier or convenient to obtain, hence the name convenient sampling. The sampling that you see here in the illustration on the slide is a convenient sample. Okay, so the researcher there in red is just sampling the population, that portion that's directly around him or her. Now, convenience sampling is, is typically a bad thing to do because it introduces bias into your sampling. And the bias comes from the disparity between what's directly around you and what's far away from you. If you look at the whole population there in the illustration, you'll notice that there are three types of people. Purple people, blue people, and green people. But the sample that was taken, the what's directly around the researcher, contains blue people and green people, but no purple people. Okay, So no purple people means that your sample is not entirely representative of your population. And hence, whatever statistical analysis you do on your sample will not be completely applicable to the population. But uh, in your statistical sample, I mean, that's, that's typically what we say, is that the sample is representative of the population. So in this case, using this type of sampling method, you're going to introduce a bias into your, into your methodology, which will taint the results of your, of your study, leading to erroneous conclusions. So no purple people uh, is a bad thing. Although, you know, typically I, I would think that no purple people would be a good thing. Because no purple people, I mean, who wants to be purple? Hello, people should not be purple, okay? But then neither should people be blue or green. I mean, if you've got a blue person there, he's probably asphyxiating, and you probably need to get him some help. 
At any rate, you want to try to avoid convenient sampling because it introduces a bias into your analysis. Another type of sampling that we see is stratified sampling. And in this type of sampling, you're basically taking the population and dividing it into two or more subgroups that share similar characteristics and then you sample from each subgroup or stratum. So here you see the illustration. We've taken our individuals and we put all the blue ones together. We put all the red ones together and we put all the green ones together. And then we've taken sampling randomly from each group. This is stratified sampling. So you're randomly the individual uh, groups that you're that you're dividing your population into. Then we have what's called cluster sampling. In cluster sampling, you divide the population area into sections, which are called clusters. And then you're going to randomly choose which clusters you're going to include in the sample. Now, taking sampling by clusters means that you don't just take certain members of each cluster, as you would in stratified sampling. No, no. In cluster sampling, you're going to take every member of each cluster that you randomly select. So here in the example, you've got, you know, your 12 individual members of your population, dividing it into six different areas. So each member, uh, each, excuse me, each member is a, is a uh, each member of the population is also a member of a different cluster, but then you're going to randomly select a couple of these clusters. So we select two of them, and then notice how all the members of each cluster that's randomly chosen are selected for the sample. This is cluster sampling. Then we have multi-stage sampling. And in multi-stage sampling, you basically have a sampling methodology where you've got different stages. And then at each stage, you're using a different sampling method. So an example would be, you know, an in-home survey, it's conducted face-to-face. So perhaps, you know, you're going to take a region, you know, say like the Treasure Valley, and you're going to divide it into areas using systematic sampling. Okay, so systematically, you're going to sample the, the region to get the areas you're going to take a closer look at. So let's say you do that with the Treasure Valley, and you come up with Napa and Meridian. Okay, well, then you cluster sample households within each of those areas. So you're going to divide each of those areas up into clusters, say uh, the different neighborhoods representing uh, each of those different areas, and then you're going to randomly select households within, uh, you know, uh, from clusters within each of those areas. So let's say, you know, continuing our example, you took uh, the neighborhoods that are directly adjoined to Meridian High School. And another cluster would be, say, you know, an area of, uh, area of neighborhoods that's, uh, directly, uh, by the mall, Carter Mall. So those two you know, clusters, all of the households within those, within those clusters then become part of our sample. And then we further refine our sample with another stage in which we go to each house within those neighborhoods and we randomly select one person in each of those households. That's an example of multi-stage sampling. So <clears throat> sampling methods are really important to keep in mind because they influence the quality of our data set. But it's not the only influence. Okay, how we design our statistical study, the the way in which we're going to use not only, not only source the data and collect it, but also use the data and analyze it, that has a, a really powerful influence on the results we get from our study as well. So in that light, we need to look at different ways or different types, rather, of ways to organize our analysis. And there are different types of observational studies and there are different types of experiments okay so different ways to organize observational studies different ways to organize or design your experiment and you see them here on the screen let's talk about each one of those in turn so first let's tackle the observational study types first we have cross-sectional studies now 
in a cross-sectional study, you're basically looking at you know two or more different groups, and you're collecting data on those groups uh, for one specific point in time. So an example would be, say, a survey of risk factors between smokers and non-smokers during a given year. Another example would be, say you take a group of sixth graders and you compare their reading abilities based on, you know, what economic background they come from, you know, poor, middle class, or wealthy. So these are examples of cross-sectional studies because we're looking at one point in time. Another way to look at an observational study is to not just look at one point of time, but to go back in time and look for a range of time in the past. Okay, so a range of time into the past would produce a retrospective study. Okay, here the data is collected by going back into some, usually into some old records somewhere, although you can also conduct interviews of people. You know, do you remember such and such from such and such time? Uh, these are retrospective studies. Now, you probably have heard them referred to by a more popular name of case studies. So if you've ever heard of a case study, th this is exactly what we're talking about. It's a retrospective study. An example would be, let's say, you know, chemicals used in tire manufacturing. We want to investigate whether these chemicals increase the risk of death. Okay, given the nature of tire manufacturing, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, yeah, they probably do. So I would expect my study to say yes, but I'm going to keep an open mind. Maybe it's totally healthy to be around chemicals used in tire manufacturing. I don't know. I'm going to let the math tell me what it tells me. So in order to conduct this type of study, what you would want to do first, you'd want to evaluate employee records for the tire manufacturing plant to see who had what exposure. You know, what, what chemicals were they exposed to? How long was the exposure? When were they exposed? Uh, these types of things. And then you'd want to pair that up with an examination of public death records at the county courthouse to determine which employees died. So then you've got your two subsets. You've got the group that died and the group that didn't die. And then you compare them with your statistical analysis to see, well, you know, is there a statistical significant result with the exposure of these chemicals, you know, when you compare to look at the increase in the risk of death? That's a retrospective study. And then, you know, you could also flip that on the other side and look into the future. And if you're looking into the future instead of the past, then this is what we call a perspective study. Okay, now statisticians like to call the groups in perspective studies that share common factors cohorts. And that's why perspective studies are sometimes called cohort studies or also longitudinal studies because you're looking at a long you know, length of time into the future usually. So an example would be, let's say we want to investigate, you know, is there any relationship between obesity and heart attack in women? And so we're going to do a perspective study over the next 10 years. It's perspective because we're looking at the next 10 years. We're looking into the future. Okay, so to the study, you'd enroll your participants and then you'd collect data to get, you know, what's the baseline that we're there at today. And then you'd follow up in the future continue to collect data over the next 10 years and then you know at the end of the 10 years you have your data set and then you could analyze it statistically to get your results and your conclusions that's a perspective study so that's basically the three types of observational designs that we could look at now let's take a look at how to design experiments so a common way to design experiments is with randomization and this is just basically, you basically want to, um, a randomized design just assigns your, your subjects and your sample, uh, to different groups on a random basis. So there's no rhyme or reason to what you pick. Each individual subject has the same chance of being selected in the sample. So that's randomized design. Replication is where you can repeat an experiment on more than one subject. And replication is an important part of experimental design because it usually indicates that your results are more reliable. Typically, what happens uh, with replication, 
uh, if, if you don't have the replication, it's typically because your sample size was too small. And the problem with having too small a sample size, as we pointed out in the last lecture, is that it's, it introduces a bias into your statistical analysis to where your conclusions are just not as reliable. So small samples typically behave erratically in statistical studies. And that's just a fancy statistical way of saying, yeah, you know what? When you don't have a lot of numbers, they tend to have more variation. They tend to be more, they had to tend to have an average, uh, a greater quantity of spread, which is called standard deviation, which we'll actually get to in a future lecture. Uh, but for purposes of this lecture, you just, you know, small sample sizes, they just, they tend to have erratic behavior. That just means they tend to be a little more spread out, tend to have more variation. Okay. Whereas larger groups of numbers tend to be more collected around central values. Uh, well, the problem with having more variation is that it disguises the effects of different treatments. So if you can't tell the difference between a control group and a treatment group because your sample size is too small and you've got too much variation, you can't weed out the noise from the signal to use engineering terminology. So, you know, it's all just one big mass of in uh, of influx data and, and you just can't do anything with it you can't you can't determine anything from it so you want to ensure your sample sizes are large enough and you know as i said before there are mathematical equations for determining sufficient sample size so we're going to you know when we get to that point in the course you know we'll embrace that we'll let the math tell us how big our sample size should be. And then the question becomes, okay, how can we get that, that large of a sample size? What can we do to get that? So um, make sure that you have large enough sample sizes so that you can get enough replication. That's a good thing. And then another way is to just, you know, make sure your samples are random randomized. I mean, random sampling is a, is a great way to ensure that your results can be replicated. Now, another aspect of experimental design you've probably heard of, if you've ever heard the term double blind, uh, you, you've, uh, you've basically heard about one aspect, and maybe you didn't really know what that meant. Well, blinding is simply saying that you don't know whether or not a subject has a treatment or a placebo. Are you a member of the treatment group or the control group? We don't know, okay? There's two different levels at which blinding can occur. Okay, one level the subject doesn't know, and on the other level the experimenter or the researcher doesn't know. A study that's blind on both of these levels is called double blind, and these are actually the more reliable studies because each level of blinding eliminates an element of bias in the data set. I mean, if you know that you've got a sugar pill instead of the real thing, I mean, that, that, just that knowledge of knowing that, okay, I don't have any special treatment. I don't know, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's not going to be any effect here. Just thinking that can have an effect over your body and influence the result. So, uh, you know, double blind is really what you want to go for. It eliminates more of that bias because there's a bias that's introduced when the subject knows, and there's a bias that's introduced when the experimenter knows. Okay? So, you know, maybe the experimenter is like, you know what? I kind of like you. I'm going to give you a sugar pill. I don't like you. I hope this treatment makes you suffer. I'm going to give you the treatment. I mean, there's, there's bias that can be introduced that way, you know? So you want to, you know, shoot for the double blind if at all possible. Now, one aspect that comes when you're designing your experiment that you want to try to avoid is called confounding. This is not an experimental design per se. Rather, it's an effect of having a poor experimental design. Confounding is where you have, you know, a situation that you're not able to distinguish between the effects of different factors. Okay. Ideally, in your statistical analysis, you want to be able to say, that a certain independent variable is the cause of an effect or an outcome. But confounding occurs when you have other variables that are influencing the relationship between the variable that you would like to say is the cause and the other variable that you would like to say is the outcome. 
And when you have that, you know, other influences, you have what's called confounding. So you want to try to plan your experiment to avoid confounding. And there are different ways to do that that we'll get into later in the course. Of course, another thing you want to keep in mind when you're designing your statistical analysis is the effect of variables within your design. And you want to try to control those effects as much as possible. Again, it's all about eliminating bias and variability. So you can have a completely randomized experimental design in which you just randomly assign subjects to different groups. You can have a randomized block design in which you form different blocks. Okay, so this is, this is similar to the, the stratified sampling that we saw earlier. Form blocks and then assign treatment to random members in each block. Uh, looking at match pairs design. So you compare two treatment groups using subjects that are matched in pairs. They're somehow related or have similar characteristics. So let's say you're doing a study where you're looking at the tr effect of a treatment on men and women and you're evaluating husband and wives. So the husband and wives are matched pairs. And you've got two groups that you're both giving a treatment to and you're looking at the difference between those two groups. Uh, then you also have a rigorously controlled design. Okay, in a rigorously controlled design, you're going to be careful in how you assign your subjects to different treatment groups because what you want is each treatment group to be similar in ways that are important to the experiment. We'll, we'll get into each of these more as we get more into the course, but I, I want to give you an introduction to each of these uh, as we get into establishing a foundation for the rest of the class. Now, no matter how well you plan and design your study or experiment, you're going to have to deal with error. Okay, We're living in an imperfect world. And in an imperfect world, you're always going to have some amount of error. Okay, But what you want to do is try to minimize the error as much as possible. Now, part of doing that is understanding the different types of error. First type of error we have is what's called sampling error. Sampling error is essentially the difference between the result of your sample and the result you would have if you had a, a census where you, you're taking every member of the population. Okay, There's always going to be some little bit of difference because no sample is exactly characteristic of its population. There's always going to be some divergence, some little bit of difference between this, the characteristics of the sample and the characteristics of the population. Okay, So those differences, those chance fluctuations, um, produce what's called sampling error. And it's the most difficult type of error to eliminate or minimize because it's just in the nature of taking a sample. Okay, You, you, can't, you can't completely eliminate that, that disparity of, of, of characteristic sets between the sample and the population because we live in an imperfect world. So there comes a point where you do what you can and then you just have to live with the error that you have. The understanding that, okay, we have this little bit of error, we report that with our results and keep in mind that it may limit the applicability of our conclusions. Now, in addition to sampling error, you have what's called non-sampling error. And this basically deals with an error in the way data is managed. So you might have selected a bias sample, okay? Perhaps you were, you know, uh, using a convenient sample where you just take what's, in, what's convenient or what's directly around you or what's easy to get. Perhaps you're using a defective measurement device, okay? Maybe uh, it's in a piece of electronics that uh, wasn't properly powered. You got little batteries or something, you know? Or, you know, maybe it's a straight edge where, you know, part of the edge is worn, so it's not exactly flush with a level surface. Uh, you know, there's different ways of having a defective instrument. Perhaps the instrument itself is not necessarily defective in the sense of uh, being worn uh, or being too old or not having enough power. Maybe it's a matter of just being out of calibration. Uh, you know, one of the things that I did regularly as part of my uh, duties as a materials engineer working in the lab was, you know, all the measurement instruments, you know, I was, every so often you'd have to go through these calibration exercises to make sure that everything is in tip-top shape and that, you know, its measurement ability is within a certain uh, 
you know, a tolerance of error so that it's acceptable, so we can rely on the instrument to give us a, you know, a reasonable measurement. Also, you know, sometimes, you know, depending on how you got the, the data managed in your analysis, maybe you're, you know, transcribing it from one place to another, and there's an error in transcription. Okay, that's another example of non-sampling error. Uh, so there's different ways that this can occur, but you can see that on all of these examples, it's easier to eliminate this type of error than it is to eliminate sampling error. Okay. Of course, the easiest type of error to eliminate is what's called non-random sampling error. And this occurs when you choose a sampling method that's not random. This is the easiest to eliminate because you just got to design your experiment or your study to use a random sampling. That's, that's really easy to get rid of. Okay. So different types of errors, no matter what you do, you're always going to have some. But the point is to try to minimize it as much as possible. So in summary, when you're designing your experiments, you want to remember three very important considerations. First, you want to randomize okay, your sample selection. Okay? Introduce as much randomization as possible. The more randomized you get, the, the less bias you're going to have in your study. Second, you want to try to include replication. And this is just basically a statistical way of saying, get a large enough sample set. Make sure your size is big enough. Okay? And again, we're going to let the math do that for us. And three, we want to control the effects of variables, you know, by, you know, with, with blinding techniques and completely randomized experimental design. So beyond that, we're going to try to reduce error as much as possible, but realize that there's only so much that we can do and that there comes a point where you just have to say, okay, you know, here's the results of the study. It's going to have this much error in it, and just keep that in mind when you're applying the study, the results of the study. That's just, that's just the way that is. So that concludes our lecture for sections 1.3 and 1.4. If you have any questions, make sure you reach out to me. Otherwise, uh, I will see you in class. Thanks for watching.